Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Lord's house on this first Lord's Day of March, also known as Transfiguration Sunday. Kindly stand, sisters and brothers, for the lighting of the altar candles. that you sign the attendance pads found on the ends of the pews. And if you are coming for the first time, if you are a visitor, uh, we'd like you to indicate. And anyone that would like our special ministry, if you have a special need and you'd like us to respond, please kindly let us know so that we can respond accordingly. We'd like to welcome those who are joining us by way of the internet, our web ministry, or those of you out there who are sharing with us at this time, a warm welcome from the Fulton First United Methodist Congregation. Uh, we say special thanks to our web sponsors for today, Sue Brown, in celebration of Tom Brown's birthday on the 7th of March. Yay! The Mossbury family in honor of the hospitality team. The Fulton First United Methodist Men in honor of their church family. And Don Dyack in honor of his church family. Thanks to all of the sponsors. Please continue to support this very vital ministry of this congregation. Let us join in the call to worship, which is the responsive psalm for today, Psalm 99. The Lord is king, let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim, let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion, he is exalted over all the peoples. Mighty King, lover of justice, you have established equity, you have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Extol the Lord our God, worship at his footstool, holy is he. Moses and Aaron were among his priests. Samuel also was among those who called on his name. They cried to the Lord and he answered them. He spoke to them in the pillar of cloud. They kept his decrees and the statutes that he gave them. O Lord, our God, you answered them. You were a forgiving God to them, but an avenger of their wrongdoings. And so the Lord our God, and worship at his holy mountain. For the Lord our God is holy. O oh, worship the King, all glorious above. Our opening hymn, 73. Mm -hmm.
be with you. Please remain standing for prayer. Holy God, mighty and immortal, you are beyond our knowing, yet we see your glory in the face of Jesus Christ, whose compassion illumines the world, transform us into the likeness of the love of Christ, who renewed our humanity so that we may share in his divinity. Gracious Father, we are all struck at the magnitude of your grace. Forgive us for underestimating that grace so often. Enlighten the eyes of our heart that we might know the richness of your grace. May the immeasurable ocean of your grace supply our daily need. We give thanks that we have been brought safely to the beginning of another month, of another day. Thank you, gracious God, that we can gather in this place. As we worship in this hour, we pray that your presence will fill us. Shine your light on our darkness and speak to us so that we may go forth to transform your world to your honor. Amen. Amen. And now we join in singing the Lord's Prayer.
offertory prayer. O oh, loving God, we give thanks for all the gifts you have so freely given unto us. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. And now, as we gather for worship, we pray that you will accept the gifts that we offer, along with ourselves, our souls, our bodies, and all that we have and all that we are. Use us, O oh Lord, for the building up of your church and for the extension of your kingdom here on earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Give them a round of applause. You see how we play this carrot? <laughs> and then the bells. You didn't hear the bell? You'll hear it another time. And then the web. You see, they use whatever they had to express or show their love for Jesus. Jesus loves us. God loves us. There's a verse in the Bible, John 3, 16. Say that. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. Say That he gave his only son. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. John 3.16. Now, you can go through the Bible and find many verses that tell of the love of God, the love of Jesus. Now, this is the Bible here. This is one copy of the Bible. It says, the Holy Bible, giant print. And I believe in most homes there is a Bible. And it is important as believers, as Christians, that we read the Bible because the Bible is like any other book that you might read. Do you like to read? But sometimes you have to read whether you like it or not. <laughs> you know, when you go to school, there are times when there are certain books that the teacher or the teachers would want you to read. And if you're going to do well in the subject or the course, you have to read those books. So the Bible is the Christian's textbook. This is recommended reading for those of us who are Christians. And it is important as you grow in the faith that you learn as much as you can about the Bible. Now, though it is in this form as one book, it is really several books. Um, in most Bibles, we find 66 books. So you see there is reading for a long time. So I want to encourage you to read your Bible because in the Bible you will discover that God loves you, God loves me, God loves us all because God made us all. And no matter what we are like, God loves us and God <laughs> wants the best for us. And the Bible contains stories that will help you to understand and appreciate the love of God. There's another verse in the Bible, 2 Corinthians um, chapter 5, um, verse, verse 4, which says, For the love of Christ constrains us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the love of Christ constrains us. So I pray that that love will always be in your heart, constraining you, pushing you, and compelling you to do those things that God wants you to do. So let us pray now. O oh, loving God, we thank you for the reminder of your great love for us and for all humankind. And I pray now that your, your blessing will be upon these children, that they will grow up to know your love, and that they will share that love with others. So be with them now and be with us all 
and grant us your peace and your blessing for Christ's sake. Amen. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face mm -hmm. shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. So you may go now, see Maddie there, go with her to Children's Church and have a very good day. God bless you. Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. Luke 9, 28. Friday, the first day of this month, was World Day of Prayer and International Observance. And our text for today tells us that Jesus took three of his disciples and went up on a hill, or some translations say on a mountain, to pray. The story of the transfiguration is filled with lots of symbolism. There is the mention of going to the mountain to pray. There is a change in Jesus' appearance and apparel, and there is the cloud that overshadowed them while they were there. Jesus prayed, the story says, and while he was praying, Jesus engaged in the practice of prayer. He was no stranger to prayer. He was in the habit of praying. In the midst of a busy life, Jesus took time to pray. Through prayer, he prepared to meet the challenges and the demands of life. Our text says, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. These words remind me of something that the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said. <clears throat> We've got some difficult days ahead. King told an overflowing crowd in Memphis, Tennessee on the 3rd of April, 1968, where the city sanitation workers were striking. And I continue with the quote, he says, but it really doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop. I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we, as a people, will get to the promised land. According to what we know, it was less than 24 hours after these prophetic words that King was assassinated. We've got some difficult days ahead. Jesus had some difficult days ahead. He was on a journey a journey that would lead to Calvary, to the cross. And Jesus took Peter, James, and John and went to the mountain to pray. The cross was looming larger and larger before him. Soon, he would drink to the dregs the bitter cup of suffering and make the ultimate sacrifice. In preparation for facing the difficult days ahead, Jesus and his disciples went to the mountain to pray. In his book, The Complete Collection of E.M. Bounds on Prayer, the author, E.M. Bounds, writes, 
You can do more than pray after you have prayed, said the godly Dr. A. J. Gordon. But you cannot do more than pray until you have prayed. You can do more than pray after you have prayed. But you cannot do more than pray until you have prayed. Friends, as we reflect on the story of the transfiguration, it tells us some things, very important things about prayer. Prayer takes us to another elevation. The story says Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain or on the hill to pray. They went to another level, to another plane. And that is what happens when we pray. It takes us to another level, to another elevation, to another plane. Additionally, going up the mountain to pray suggests that Jesus sought solitude, quietness, stillness. The idea here is that Jesus and his disciples left the noise, the deafening din of the world below in order that they might seek the silence of the mountaintop, the stillness of that place to pray, to be in the presence of God. The hymn writer says, and we will sing this hymn today, sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer that calls me from a world of care and bids me at my Father's throne make all my wants and wishes known. In seasons of distress and grief, my soul has often found relief and oft escaped the tempter's snare by thy return sweet hour of prayer. As we face the difficult days ahead, whether personally, in our church, in our community, as we embark upon the journey that is sure to be difficult, let us go to that new elevation in prayer. Let us seek that solitude where we can settle ourselves, our hearts, and listen for the voice of God above all the other voices, even our own voices, that clamor for our attention so that we might hear what God has to say to us. What I see in this story is how prayer changes our disposition. The story speaks about a change that came over Jesus as he prayed. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed. And his clothes became dazzling white. <laughs> We can say, and we can see in this an example of the changes that occur, the changes that are possible when we pray. Now, one of the great insights about prayer that came to me was when I read something, um, a man by the name of Soren Kierkegaard, a theologian, a theologian wrote. He wrote, prayer does not change God, but it changes him who prays. Prayer does not change God, but it changes him or her who prays. And this is important, and it helped me recognize that while prayer can and does bring about change, 
And as Alfred Tennyson says, and I quote, pray for my soul. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. Wherefore, let thy voice rise like a fountain for me night and day. Yes, prayer can bring about change. But oftentimes, my friends, the change begins with the one who prays. And that is important to remember. You know, I may pray for someone to be healed from some dreaded disease. And it might turn out that that person dies in spite of my prayers. But coming to terms with that is sometimes the result of prayer. Learning to accept that outcome is sometimes the result of prayer. So prayer may not always change the circumstances around us. But prayer can at least change our disposition, our attitude, and our outlook. So when we pray, let us be open to the change from, from the inside out, that personal change that God wants to work in us. So that in turn, we might be prepared with the right disposition, with the right attitude, with the right approach to work for change in the world. Where do we need to change so that our lives will reflect the glory of God is a question that we should ask when we pray. And finally, my friends, prayer helps us receive God's confirmation. It can be said that the greatest benefit of this mountaintop experience for Jesus and his disciples is that they heard from God. They heard the voice of God. God was present on that mountaintop where Jesus and his disciples had gone to pray. The cloud which overshadowed them was a symbol of God's presence. And the voice that spoke to them from the cloud was the voice of God. Bringing confirmation that Jesus was God's chosen one. And that his word could be trusted. And so the disciples were exhorted by that voice, listen to him. Listen to him. So pray before you <coughs> act. And your actions will be guided by God's spirit. Seek confirmation from God. There are all kinds of, of media that we use to communicate or make contact with others. Prayer, my friends, is an effective medium of communication with the God of glory and the God of wisdom. Let us not neglect to use that very powerful and effective tool or resource or medium so that we may communicate with God. When we take the time to pray, we open the lines of communication with God who speaks often in the silence and in the stillness. And through people of old, like, like Moses, the great leader of the people of Israel, to whom God gave the law that Moses might pass on to the people who led the people out of their bondage, their oppression in Egypt. Through Elijah, the prophet and other prophets, God speaks to us through such individuals. And when we listen to God in prayer, we gain insight and understanding about how we might face the issues and challenges of life in the light, the wisdom, the strength, and the courage 
that God can give us. So when our actions are confirmed by God in prayer, then what we say and what we do will bring honor to God. necessary that we may be your new creation in body, mind, and spirit. Holy Spirit, put your seal upon us that we may be filled with zeal for God's work through us as his agents of reconciliation. O oh, gracious God, today we pray for those who are celebrating. We thank you for those sponsoring our web ministry, 
Sue Brown, the Boschbury family, the Fulton First United Methodist men, and Don Dyack. We thank you, Lord, for the people and the occasions that they recognize today. Tom Brown, as he celebrates his birthday on the 7th. We remember also Abigail Florizic, as she turns three on Tuesday. We pray for Linda Aquaviva, celebrating birthday today. We thank you for our hospitality team and pray that this will always be a hospitable congregation. That all who come here will know that they are welcome, they are accepted, they are loved. And Lord, we thank you for your love that constrains us and helps us to reach out to others. We thank you, Lord, for this congregation and pray that you will continue to fashion us and mold us into the people that you want us to be. We lift up those who are sick. We think of those whose names are listed in our bulletin. We pray also for Ethan. We remember Grady. We pray for Kim, Christina, the friend of Carolyn Mogier, or Carolyn Mogier's cousin, and others, O oh Lord, who are known to us, who are sick, who are recuperating after surgery or, or some other kind of illness. We pray for our sister, Pastor Vivian Somerville. And I remember today in a very special way my father, Collins, and my sister, Jennifer, there in Miami, who are frequent viewers of this online service. Lord, I lift them up to you and pray for them and all your people everywhere that you will grant us your peace, grant us your life. Transfigure your world as you transfigure your church, Lord God, that all may be made new and whole. We pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. So my sisters and brothers, you are invited to the fellowship hall after the service concludes for a time of fellowship, a time of sharing. We will close with the hymn, Sweet Hour of Prayer, that calls me from a world of care. Mm -hmm. 